the last of it yet. Um, we have Jamie Stern Weiner. Are you with us, Jamie? He's done a mm. lot of work on the question of the IRA uh, misdefinition of uh, anti Semitism. So we're very pleased to have you with us. Welcome. Thanks, Tina. Um, okay, so I want to use my 10 minutes um, here to just help clarify what I think are the principles at stake. Uh, in the fight over the IHRA working definition. The definition supporters say um, it's just a tool to help with consistent data collection, or it's just a symbolic commitment, that it poses no danger to free speech, and that it has nothing whatsoever to do with defending Israel from legitimate criticism. It must just be a coincidence then that debate over the IHRA definition in multiple countries has consistently pit supporters of Israel on the one side, against progressive Jewish groups, Palestine solidarity activists, and civil liberties campaigners on the other. It must all just be a giant misunderstanding. Well, to dispel this confusion and mystification, help clear the way for a debate about the principles that truly are at stake, I want to make three points about the definition's genesis and applications to date. First, the definition is a pro-Israel initiative. It was drafted and negotiated in 2004 by a handful of mainly pro-Israel groups led by the American Jewish Committee. Its adoption by the IHRA in 2016 was engineered by the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Let's just focus on the Simon Wiesenthal Center for now. So this is an organization which engages in blanket pro-Israel advocacy of the crudest uh, kind, in the course of which it routinely conflates legitimate, accurate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. So just to give a flavor, um, it described EU guidelines um, which prohibit funding institutions located in Israel's illegal settlements as, quote, redolent of the 1930s Nazi boycott of the Jews throughout the Reich, which was the prelude to the Holocaust. And just recently, when the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court ruled that it had jurisdiction in Palestine, uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center accused it of, quote, anti-Semitism, and of trying to, quote, punish Jews for defending themselves from those committed to finish Hitler's genocidal goals. Um, so the working definition, it's a vehicle for investing such designations with political, regulatory, and ultimately legal authority. Second point, there are actually two IHRA working definitions. The first refers to a two-sentence passage. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but I'll just quote it for those who aren't. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. Let's call this for our purposes, the meaningless definition. The second IHRA working definition comprises a list of 11 examples of purported anti-Semitic statements of which seven make reference to Israel. These include such criteria as denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination and applying double standards to it. Let's call this list of examples Israel's definition. What's important to bear in mind is that Israel's advocates and the leading advocates of the working definition, they couldn't care less about the meaningless definition. After all, it's meaningless. Supporters of the IHRA working definition have themselves dismissed that two sentence passage as very generalist and vague, that's the campaign against anti-Semitism, or even totally neutered and unmoored from any current reality, that's the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Meanwhile, Israeli officials say that, quote, what turns the IHRA definition into an essential definition in our eyes is the list of examples. That's why they won't drop the most obviously political and indefensible examples, double standards, self-determination. Rightly or wrongly, in my view wrongly, dropping those would at one stroke neutralize most of the public criticism of the working definition. It would also plainly serve the claimed purpose of that definition, namely to provide a, cl a, a clear and consistent standard for data collectors. But they won't drop them. Why not? Because those are the examples that can be most easily used against Israel's critics. It might be wondered, why did the IHRA itself adopt Israel's definition? even as it manifestly threatens the free speech of critics of Israel? Well, the interesting answer is it didn't. The IHRA's decision-making body, in fact, excluded the 11 examples from its working definition, which comprised the meaningless definition only. This fact has subsequently been misrepresented by Israel's advocates, certain UK officials, um, and regrettably by elements of the IHRA itself. 
um, but it's easily documented and it soon will be. Third point, in practice, pro-Israel campaigners have used the definition to chill speech. Um, so it's, it's repeatedly claimed that the definition it's not intended as a tool for censorship, but its champions have also repeatedly insisted that it be used as such. Most obviously, it was demanded that Labour incorporate Israel's definition into its code of conduct. There's an ongoing international campaign pressing social media platforms to use it to censor posts. And the UK government, backed by mainstream Jewish organisations, is seeking to impose it on universities. What's more, in practice, it has been repeatedly used not just to stigmatise, but also to stifle speech. Um, we just heard a few examples from university campuses. Consider now the Labour Party. In summer 2018, pro-Israel groups demanded that Labour adopt the IHRA working definition <clears throat> and all the IHRA's examples verbatim, which is to say, in our terms, Israel's definition. Labour's attempt to only adopt most of those examples, rejecting or adapting others, was condemned as proof positive that it had an anti-Semitism problem. Everyone from the Board of Deputies, to the Community Security Trust, to government ministers insisted that, to use the words of a joint statement by seven UK delegates to the IHRA, quote, any modified version of the IHRA definition that does not include all of its 11 examples is no longer the IHRA definition. Now, this was flatly false, as noted, but it worked as Labour's ruling body capitulated and adopted Israel's definition. So how's it being used? Consider one recent case. In a historic development, Israel's leading human rights organization, B'Tselem, recently found that Israel oversees a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea that amounts to apartheid. A Labour member recently submitted a motion to their branch supporting B'Tselem's position, and calling for an end to the apartheid regime. But the chair said that it should not be put on the agenda, it was out of order, because the references to apartheid can be read as characterizing Israel as a racist endeavor, and this is contrary to the IHRA definition of antisemitism. The chair's position was supported by regional officers. In other words, we've now reached the juncture where supporting Israel's leading human rights organization is prohibited and suppressed within the Labour Party as anti-Semitic. The crucial point is not just that Israel's definition facilitates such outrages, but that its most consequential supporters either do not object to or actively encourage this assault on free speech. When one British university canceled a student event planned as part of Israel Apartheid Week, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, recall the architect of the IHRA definition, praised the move and urged other universities to follow suit. The Simon Wiesenthal Center has openly boasted about the definition's contribution to, quote, legislation condemning anti-Zionism and BDS, and recalled with satisfaction how, quote, in the United Kingdom, the IHRA definition helped to clearly expose Jeremy Corbyn and Labour's patterns of anti-Semitism and provoked a controversy that contributed to Corbyn's landslide defeat. A controversy that, to repeat, was based on a falsehood one that was propagated most authoritatively by the pro-Israel supporters of the IHRA definition. To conclude then, we can and should confidently set aside the mystification around what the definition's purpose and practical effect is. It was drafted by pro-Israel groups as a vehicle through which to stigmatize and stifle criticism of Israel. All supporters of free speech should oppose it, not just in terms of Palestine, but as a matter of principle in those terms. Thanks. Sorry, comrades, I, I was muted and chattering away there. Um, apologies for running quite so late. And thank you very much, Jamie, for this use, very useful overview of, of what's wrong with the IRA. And we will certainly can take that as a little video clip that we will put on our new website. So it's been a, an excellent uh, overview. Uh, apologies, comrades, for running quite so late. Um, I'm sure you've noticed we're not sticking to the to the agenda. I'm, I'm, I apologize, but it's been a, a really useful um, uh, conference so far. Um, there's there's one more com, com, uh, comrade who was previously just uh, indicated, and oh, we've asked her to speak as well, which was Esther Giles. Um, we've introduced her 
Earlier on, um, she was not platformed on Sunday from the Stop the Labour lockout rally um, uh, over um, her uh, apparent views on trans rights or not. But I think it's important that we show that we do not know platform and call not for no platforms of fellow socialists in particular. So um, welcome, Esther. If you could stick to three, four minutes, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very humbled and honoured to be here today. Thank you very much for having me at your conference. I'm going to talk to you about no platforming and the so-called left supposed right of intolerance, um, linking to my experiences last week. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. This quote wrongly attributed to Voltaire was actually written by, would you believe it, a woman? Beatrice Evelyn Hall in a book published in 1906 in which she wrote about Voltaire and who of course wrote under a pseudonym because she was a woman and yes I have met people who will not read anything written by a woman. Here's something that Voltaire did once write in his 1763 treatise on toleration. The supposed right of intolerance is absurd and barbaric. It is the right of the tiger Nay, it is far worse, for tigers do but tear in order to have food, while we rend each other for paragraphs. So I'm going to talk to you about my recent no platform experience and the fallout from it, why, you, why we must fight for free speech and thought and the new no platforming. Last Sunday evening, there was an event about democracy and free speech. This event was put on in defense of CLP officers suspended for disobeying the diktats of the General Secretary by allowing members to debate and or vote on topics he had forbidden. The organizers of this event no platform somebody, me, because someone had lobbied one or more of the speakers. One of the speakers who is a prospective candidate for mayor of Liverpool told the organizers that they would withdraw unless I was removed from the platform. The organizers feared that her withdrawal would spark further speakers pulling out and ask me for withdraw to withdraw for fear of the whole event collapsing. I pulled out. The event went ahead using a webinar with the chat disabled. The organizing group knew that their decision to no platform one of the advertised speakers would be a controversial one and seen as hypocritical. But they felt either that the event was more important than the principle of free speech, or that what I was accused of genuinely made me a persona non grata. I think that the organising committee was divided on the issue. It has certainly, in the fallout, revealed deep rifts in groups and campaigns. Importantly, when this happens to you, you will find out how people and groups respond to the white hot flame of the witch hunt. Some melt away like snowflakes, some swivel round and stand by the side of the witch hunters, some run for cover, and some stand in the flames by your side, including people you have never met before, and become an even more valuable gold. I want to put this no platforming in the context of free speech and explore what no platforming has now become. So what does free speech do? We've talked about this a lot already today. It, it shines a light on bad arguments and hate rather than letting it fester in dark corners. Free speech allows debate where there's this, there is disagreement about ideas and ideologies. It helps us to find the truth by dialectic. It promotes trust, honesty and respect where differing points of view are listened to. And I think we've seen some of that today. It requires confidence to challenge and that the challenge is respectful. It requires time to think and to debate. That's why in the Labour Party, for those of us who still have meetings or are allowed to go to them, we have the process of motion submitted in good time and time allotted for debate in a comradely fashion. The ability to debate com um, competing views is one of the foundations of democratic society. If, 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 di if dissent is seen as offence and then is elevated to hate speech, 
the consequences of democracy are alarming. And that is what I think we are seeing now. So what are the limits of free speech? Again, we've discussed this today. Uh, it should not, in my view, promote acts of violence. If somebody says something, a reasonable, a reasonable person would believe to be something so appalling that it should not be said, they should be called out. We should refuse and reject the rhetoric of violence. Yesterday, somebody who has been posting smears against me on social media for the past two years justified their smearing and my no platforming by saying, you are standing with people who really have been unfairly smeared and are completely innocent of all accusations. This person was saying that they were the arbiter of free speech and that with anybody with whom they disagreed should be silenced. So if we move on to the new no platforming, um, no platforming used to be a tactic used against self-proclaimed fascists, the National Front or the EGL and Holocaust deniers. But today it is particularly being used to prevent the expression of feminist arguments, critical of the sex industry and of some demands made by, made by trans activists. The feminists who hold these views, mainly second wave feminists and other sisters and brothers, have never advocated or engaged in violence against any group of people. But they are called transphobes, they are called warphobes. It is argued that the mere presence of anyone said to hold these views is a threat to a protected minority group's safety. And so comrades prevented from speaking by the opinions of the ideological thugs. In my case, it seems to have been the LGBT plus group that I cannot be sure. And we know, of course, that crit critics of Israel suffer the same fate as we've already discussed today. As somebody said to me this week, attacks on free speech and thought about Israel come from without, but the gender debate results in the left eating itself. This new no platforming approach results in people sometimes being disgraced and defamed for the rest of their lives for one comment or incident taken out of context, or even for just having been accused of something. Universities appear to be a mecca for no platformers, which doesn't augur well for the future if we don't address it now. The social justice warriors in today's universities seem to wage war to outcompete each other in their successes in no platforming people. There's a growing list of people who've been no platformed and we're hearing about some of them today, including Ken Loach this week. Um, so with Ken Loach, um, people called for his no platforming because he had repeatedly been accused of and been an apologist for anti-Semitism. Did you see what they did there? They said he should be no platform because he had been accused of something and the event had nothing to do with what he was being accused of. This is another feature of the new no platforming. Anyway, the college did stand firm and say that no platforming is not the way to pursue the goals of a free and open academic community. And the event did go ahead. Again at Oxford University this week, John McDonnell has been urged by the Labour Society not to share a platform with a woman they call a known transphobe, Professor Selena Todd, who writes and teaches about class, inequality, working class history, feminism and women's lives. The attackers say the content of the event is irrelevant to the issue at hand, namely that McDonnell is lending his social and political capital to a person whose views actively harm the trans community. As one of the Twitter comments say, I thought universities were about debate, not censorship. So the defamation escalates. First, you call somebody a transphobe, then next time you can call them a known transphobe. Next, then you call them, once you call them a known transphobe, you become a notorious transphobe, all without saying a single word and just because your attackers say it again and again and again. So individuals are being no platformed, not because of what they actually say, but because of what people think they think because they are not ideologically pure according to a particular group with influence. And at the same time, other people are blackmailed into withdrawing or requiring withdrawal of the heretic for fear of guilt by association and worse. 
So right. Can you start winding up? Sorry. Yes. In conclusion, and what does it mean? It means that we allow them to. Those groups with influence control the narrative. They control what people say, and this begins to control what people think. It means that people walk and think in fear that they might say something that would damage them for the rest of their lives. It means that ideas cannot be debated in public. These ideas now include Palestine, Israel as an apartheid state, women's rights. Has anyone ever been no platform for wanting to debate trans rights? Class analysis, talk about identity politics as much as you like. It means that people are not allowed to think and have a say unless within the agreed political narrative. It means that democracy dies. And remember, first they came for the TERFs, then the so-called anti-Semites, and, anti and then they will come for you. Free speech and democracy for all solidarity. Thank you, Esther. This is clearly a discussion that is hotly disputed in the Labour Party and in the Labour movement, actually, across all organisations on the left. And you're quite rightly saying it's tearing some organisations apart, actually. Which is a which is a horrible, and it's a it's very I think it's very much linked to the ID politics and um, going down that road rather than looking for working class politics. It's people splitting up in smaller and smaller groups. But it's very important that we hear a debate, and the Labour Left Alliance, which I'm uh, involved in, is actually has been discussing putting on a debate, but it's we're a little bit fearful on it because the debate has become so toxic on both sides, which is a huge shame because both sides have very valid arguments, I think, and we're still trying to work out how a debate like this could be could be organized in a in a comradely uh, fashion that that hears everybody and you know does not no platform and I think that's what we agree on all of us isn't it no view on this matter should be no platform and if one of them is particularly wrong let's hear it let's debate it let's vote it down and let's show why it's wrong but uh, to no platform to comrade a, co a comrade like Esther or you know other uh, feminist activists is is absolutely the wrong way to go especially because it's uh, tearing our organizations apart so Thank you very much for joining us, comrades. Okay, we're having, um, uh, we know we're all running really late, comrades. I'm wondering if we could move to the vote on this charter or if comrades want to discuss this a bit more because it is, I mean, it is an important issue. All sorts of important issues have been raised, but we, I'm, I'm a bit worried about time. We've got Norman Finkelstein in the, in the audience, Samia Ramadani, who was, uh, who was scheduled, to speak, scheduled to speak now. I hope they can uh, stay with us a little while longer. Okay, we have two two comrades raise their hands. Let's 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 hear them because um, we don't want to shut down debate in this conference. That would be the wrong thing to do. Okay, uh, Norman, I think wants to speak first, um, and then David Evans. But we are, I'm asking comrades to keep it to like about two minutes if you can. I've, can you see? Uh, yep, there we are. That's it. it. Takes me two minutes to unmute myself. Um, yeah, th <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, yes, I'm Norman Thomas. I'm the suspended chair of South Planet. Um, I'm very proud to be uh, along with Esther Giles, one of the founding members of Labour in Exile Network. I don't know, um, you know, the, the the ups and downs of the debate that uh, Esther has been involved with regarding uh, trans rights. What I do know is that it is something that needs debating, and I hope the debate will be organised. But what I also feel is, is that this de debate shouldn't be introduced into organisations that are trying to do something very different from the debate itself. That basically, um, you know, we, Labour in Exile Network is, uh, is trying to change the Labour Party into a place where free speech is allowed, where CLPs will be allowed to speak about whatever they want to speak about, including trans rights. So we're fighting for that. It's absolutely counterproductive and destructive to try to distract that organisation by people coming in, trying to talking about another issue. We're getting that on our social media site. People who are pursuing Esther come onto our social media site and start a huge debate about that. But that is not what we are trying to do. That is a debate for another time. You've got to have some kind of organization, some sort of structure in what you do or nothing ever gets done. And that's, the, I mean, we're having a, a conference on February 27th. Come to that, to the Labour in Exile Network conference. It's on the network, you can find the, uh, the website very easily. But that's what we want to do, is to change the Labour Party into a place 
where free speech is allowed. Getting distracted into huge uh, debates about something else is not what we're about. That's for another time, another organization, maybe tomorrow, but let's do it then. But please, please, let's not be distracted all the time by other things. Thanks. Thank you, comrade. Anita, please. Two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say a little bit, tiny bit, what I can fit in about what's been going on in Bristol. I would say without a doubt that Bristol is in the front line of the fight for uh, full freedom of speech. And Esther in particular has been hit from the right and from the so-called left. But what we are discovering, I'm an investigative journalist and I'm looking much more into this. What we are discovering is that the uh, trans women or women uh, supporters have been are being recruited by the right wing. And you can see that if anybody wants details and what's happened to Esther sure with Darren the, Jones. Uh, some, sorry, a bit, a bit right, interrupting. Uh, Unmute themselves, please. Um, so I'd also like to just say that last uh, two nights ago, the largest CLP in the country, Bristol West, held the most um, suspect ever AGM that I have ever experienced in my life. Um, I ran on a one woman ticket um, for to be the disability officer. Some of you might remember that it was also the learning disabled who were targeted under the Third Reich. I wasn't allowed to um, be accepted by the so-called Thangham, uh, that is the Keir Starmer slate, nor was I uh, welcomed by the uh, so-called left slate. Um, and I was told that I wouldn't be accepted because I am gender critical. I've never even discussed it with any of them. However, as Esther said so rightly, all you need to do is have guilt by association. Uh, and so I think that this is very much intertwined. And in a, in a certain way, if people here are brave enough to really listen to what Esther is saying and what we have been going through for three, four years in Bristol, I mean, I, th I think that maybe we could have a different way of going. Anyway, we don't know whether or not the Bristol West AGM is going to be invalidated, but it came from on high, it came from David Evans. Um, we weren't allowed to speak. Uh, it was a webinar just like last week. So they learned from La Est Esther's experience last week, no chat, no nothing, um, simply a voting machine. It was so bad that the uh, MP Thangham Debonair wasn't able to, able to find her vote, but they got their way. They won their slate with a hundred votes missing and vote rigging. Um, hopefully this is gonna come out in the papers. I'm working on a local paper and hopefully it's gonna go into the private eye. But if anybody has any doubts about what women particularly have been through in this city, uh, just talk to us. We're really willing to. Thank you, comrade. Um, this is, um, we're now coming to the end of this. Um, I'm Kevin, um, I'm giving Kevin the chance for a right of reply. Please, Kevin, are you there? Kevin? Uh, is he there? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to, uh, yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Um, I'll Ooh. just move it formally. Ah, okay, that makes life easier. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, comrades, um, I know that people have problems with the, with the um, hand issue, raising hands, etc. So we're just quickly going to do, uh, Yes, I'm going to do another poll for voting on the last amendment by Tony Greenstein. Um, I don't think we need a right of reply from Tony. Sorry, Tony. And he's shaking his head anyway. Okay, and it's uh, sorry, it's done it both at the same time. So, oh, it can't, can we? Um, we have to, sorry, I have to end this poll. This is, makes no sense. We have to have the separate, we have, have to have these same um, motions separately, these questions. Sorry. Um, Actually, can can comrades? Does everybody is everybody able to raise their hand? Can com most comrades raise their hand? Because I'm not sure. I don't think there's anything controversial in this. It's going to take me five minutes to draw up another poll. So I suggest um, we're just going to vote with a with a hand up. Yes. Okay. Thank you, comrades, for raising this. So we're we're, we're, we're voting on Tony's amendment or not? Uh, if you want this to go forward uh, into the charter. I'm quickly going to uh, share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. I think this is here. Right, okay. So this is uh, uh, Tony's amendment here. Add at the end, the libel courts are inaccessible to the poor and those without means. 
they are a playground for the rich. Um, at the end of point six in our charter. Okay, comrade, I'm going to stop my screen, otherwise I can't really see you voting properly. So everybody who's in favor of this, please raise your hand. And if, and then I'm going to ask those who are against it to raise their hand afterwards. Okay, I see, I see people do, some people raise their hands, some do the thumbs up, some do the clapping. I guess you can't find the other uh, issues here. Okay, so there's a number of voting methods being used, but I can see them all, so it's not a problem. Okay, uh, don't vote no at the moment. We're gonna get to that later. Okay, so we have, um, just quickly add them up, 80, 81 in favor of Tony's. Uh, can I, I'm gonna clear it all. Okay, could comrades now indicate if they're against it? If they're against this adding ad amendment from Tony, vote now. If you're against it, raise your hand or do the thumbs up button or click, click the no button, I can, I can see you. Okay, so that's eight against, so that is clearly carried. I'm gonna clear this all. Could comrades now, please vote for the charter as amended. I'm gonna say with the proviso that the steering committee has to look into um, sorting out the slightly contradictory um, two amendments we agreed on earlier. That's just how it is. Um, could you please raise your hand if you are in favor of the charter as amended by all three amendments that have all gone through? What about abstentions? I'm really sorry, I forgot about the abstentions, but I'll, I'll, I'll do this in this session, not in this one. Sorry, comrades. Okay, if you're in favor of the charter as amended, we've got 83, 84 in favor. Okay, I'm gonna clear now if you are, on a second, if you're against the charter as amended, please vote now. Okay, we have four, three, two, it's going down, that's funny. Okay, the vote against the charter is going down. We've got two, two against, this is not an ideal way to um, vote, no doubt, but this is just how it is. Thank you, comrades, and uh, any abstentions? If you could raise your hand if you want to abstain. So that's two abstentions. Thank you very much, comrade. Um, we have, we had um, comrades Norman Finkelstein and Sami Ramadani scheduled to speak about 10 minutes ago. I'm just going to ask them both if they're okay waiting until after a 10 minute break or if they want to speak now. Um, Sami, if you could I'll quickly ask you to unmute yourself. Sami is doing the thumbs up. I think that that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. You can wait till after the. That's fine. That's great. Thank you. Um, Norman, are you okay to? wait till after the 10 minute break otherwise we'll bring you in now um i'm fine with whatever works for you i would prefer however to speak now because i think it's late in your conference and many people will take advantage of the 10 minute break to take off so uh, okay we can we can bring you in now if you want and then we have a, a 10 minute break actually yes? as i said i will leave it, the decision to you but in terms of trying to reach a bigger audience, I think since it's so late in, the, in your conference, uh, people will take off now and not return. They might return because you're speaking. <laughs> yeah. People get tired. <laughs> they do get tired. Okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say then, then we, we hear from you now. If that's okay with you, unless you need a yeah few minute break, or but but if you're okay to speak, then I'm personally fine, and whatever you decide is okay with me. Okay, well we bring Norman in now, and then Sami after the break. So there's another reason to join us, <laughs> another good reason to join us after the session. So uh, yes, thank you very much, Norman, for for joining us. It's an it's an honor that you're you're with us. Um, Ten minutes, if. You can manage that on the question of free speech. And we would also love to hear what you think about perhaps our campaign and how it can go forward. 
Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I didn't uh, hear as much as I probably should have, but what I did hear actually I found uh, very substantive. And in particular, the last speaker, I found it um, um, informative. I wasn't aware of the extent to which the transgender debate is causing internecine uh, conflict. And um, I actually would like to get a copy of her intervention, which I can pass around to some friends of mine, because I happen to agree with her on this particular issue. But she articulated it with more urgency than I have been able to. Um, I had a lot of trouble figuring out what to speak on today because I was originally going to do a, my usual exhortation uh, based on John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and Bertrand Russell's writings on freedom of speech. Um, and I was pretty psyched up for doing it. But for some reason, I couldn't get myself to sit down and speak to that topic, maybe because I've said it so many times. And then I realized there was actually something I've been researching lately that was much more, I think, interesting at this point. Um, namely, I was curious to see how the classical thinkers dealt with the issue of racism. When I say classical thinkers, I mean in particular W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, du Bois was the leading African-American scholar on the subject of race and racism for the duration of the 20th century, literally. He was born just after the Civil War, and he passed in 1963, the night before the March on Washington. And for the whole of his life, which lasted fully 95 years, he was by far and away the most articulate, most um, uh, courageous speaker on the issue of racism. He was African American, I guess I should point out. And he left behind a quite voluminous uh, uh, scholarly corpus. And I've been lately looking at it, curious, where does he stand on the issue of discussing race, discussing racism, censorship, and so forth? And what was really striking to me was he was not just a scholar. He was brilliant, no question about it, but he was an activist. He was the founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. He was then the editor of their premier publication called The Crisis for 20 years. The Crisis had a circulation of 100,000, which was extraordinary for that period in time. And he was, a, he was a real militant. He was a real militant. At the end of his life, he joined the Communist Party he got arrested, he was manacled, he went through trial for a year, and he ended up, he won the trial and he ended up leaving the country. Uh, he went to live in Ghana at the end of his life. So we're not talking about a, um, <clears throat> we're not talking about a cloistered scholar. We're talking about a serious intellectual in search of truth. And we're also talking about a real political activist. So how does he deal with the question of race and racism? I was curious. First of all, the thing that's most striking about Du Bois is there are no taboos. There are no labels. There's nobody, nobody, he's not calling anybody a racist. He's not calling anybody a fascist. He's not calling for anybody to be deplatformed. He's not calling for anybody to be silenced. He sits down in his study, and he patiently looks through the evidence. What does the evidence show? So when he has to address the issue of race, he says, it is generally recognized today that no scientific definition of race is possible. Of the psychological and mental differences which exist between individuals and groups, we have as yet only tentative measurements and limited studies. These are not sufficient to divide mankind into definite groups 
nor to indicate the connection between physical and mental traits. I know it sounds a little boring to read it over Zoom, but in my opinion, it's important to listen to the language. He's talking about the racial inheritance of intelligence. That's a very hot topic. Are black people genetically inferior to white people when it comes to intelligence? Does he say, this is outrageous, this is fascist, this is Nazism? Does he say that? No. He says very calmly, we have as yet only tentative measurements and limited studies. These are not sufficient to divide mankind into definite groups. You calmly compose, look at the evidence. You don't run from it. You don't fear it. You don't try to suppress, to deplatform what you don't agree with. Then he has to look at the question of all these intelligence tests that purport to prove white people are superior to black people. He goes through all the evidence step by step by step and says, it's not convincing. If you look at the evidence, it doesn't persuade. He doesn't say, this is an outrage. This has to be suppressed. We can't talk about it. This is fascism. No. And he makes along the way, in my opinion, quite interesting observations. He says, for example, the fundamental and logical difficulty with all racial comparison is that there is no way of determining just what a race is. What is a race? Before you can say black, the black race is genetically inferior to the white race, what is a race? And he says, there's just no scientific way of reaching a consensus on that basic question. Once again, to emphasize, not to suppress, not to silence, not to uh, deplatform, not to run and hide, but to confront the issues and try patiently to parse the evidence and see where matters stand. And even to say, even if the evidence today shows no racial difference, he says, that's still tentative. Our knowledge is still limited. We still don't have a final answer on the question, what is racism? Everybody here, or not everybody, permit me to take that back. A large number of people here in your forum, they're clear on what racism is. We have to deplatform racism, we have to silence racism. But you have a basic question, what is racism? The boy spent the whole of his life trying to figure out that question. He started out in 1900 thinking, well, racism is about ignorance. If I can show the, the world the truth, we can get rid of racism. Then he starts reading Marx and he comes to the conclusion, no, racism, racism is more than about ignorance. He says, if you look at when racism began in the modern era, he says it begins in the first third of the 19th century to justify the slave trade and to justify slavery. He says, it's about profits. But then he says, hey, we have a problem here. White and black workers, they don't get along. In fact, the poor whites hate nobody more than black people. So he says, we have a problem. Why is it if race is about, racism is just about capitalist profits, white and black workers don't get along, they don't unite? And he says, well, that's a complicated question. First, he says, 
there's a natural human propensity to monopoly. White people want to monopolize the best jobs. So they don't like, they don't want competition for black people. But then he says, there's another problem. Black people are used, are accustomed to lower wages than white workers. So black people tend to bid down wages. And so we have to keep them out of our jobs. But then he says, there's a third problem. He calls it the psychic wage. White workers want to feel better than somebody. They have the desire to feel better. So they would rather get lower wages if it means black people will be below them. He calls it the psychic wage of uh, capitalism or the psychic wage of the working class. Then later in his life, he comes under the influence of Freud. And he says, you know what? We have to acknowledge it. There is a large amount of racism that's completely irrational. It's deep in our psyche, buried deep in our psyche, and it has no rational basis. For example, what he calls the racial sex jealousy. All of the lynchings that are occurring in the South based on the claim that Black men are rapists and will rape our white women. And that whole racial sex jealousy, he says, it's not rational. It's deep in our psyche, deep in what he calls our folklore. The point being, the fight against racism is very complex. It's not an easy, just get rid of the ruling class, get rid of capitalism and we'll abolish racism. No, it has many components. It's multivalent. In order to rationally try to address this topic of racism, you have to have full, frequent and fearless debate. Now, there was one occasion, one occasion in his lifetime of 95 years when he advocated censorship. One, what? The occasion was the birth of the modern film industry. The modern film industry is usually dated its birth with this film called Birth of a Nation. And Birth of a Nation was a very sophisticated, for its time, a very sophisticated technical achievement for cinema. It was also, the theme was racism. It was white people trying to protect themselves from rapist black men. And the boy said, we have a problem here. Number one, this film is technically very sophisticated. We black people, we don't have the financial resources or the technical competence to fight this film. And number two, he said, this film is directly causing a large number of lynchings of black people. He says, you could just look at the numbers. The numbers are going through the roof because of this film. And he said in this one single exception, I think, we should fight for censorship. Now, he recognized he came into conflict with a lot of his friends over this. I would want to make two points. Number one, in his 95 years, this was the one single exception he made. He writes about it in his autobiographies. I recognize I made one exception here. It was the one single exception he made. And number two, I'm fully willing to acknowledge it was a complex issue for the reasons he laid out. And in the fact, just in a personal note, I had an essay contest on my website. How would you answer Du Bois' arguments? I thought they were tough. They were tough, but it was one case. Otherwise, um, I'll leave off with one thing he said. Uh, in his most famous book, Black Reconstruction, he tries to address the question, 
why couldn't the South look forward, look to the future, not look backwards after the Civil War and try to resolve this issue of race? And he said the reason the South was unable to do it was because of censorship. And I'll read, it's a, just a very brief paragraph. I'll just leave off there. He says, he's talking about after the Civil War, what's called the period of Reconstruction. Why was there no support for a forward-looking policy in the South among poor whites, among the white working class? He writes, in the South, there was absence of any leadership corresponding in breadth and courage to that of Abraham Lincoln. Here comes the penalty which a land pays when it stifles free speech and free discussion and turns itself over entirely to propaganda. He says, it does not make any difference at the time if the things you advocate are absolutely right. What Tony Greenstein, what David Miller advocate, they may be absolutely right. He says it does not make any difference if what you advocate is absolutely right. He says the nation nonetheless becomes morally emasculated and mentally hogtied and cannot evolve that healthy difference of opinion, which leads to the discovery of truth under changing conditions. The healthy difference of opinion, which leads to the discovery of truth under changing conditions. Conditions change, you have to constantly examine probe, rethink, rethink your certainties and your certitudes. Otherwise, your country gets, or your political party, gets morally emasculated and mentally hogtied. And that to me should be the lesson for all of us that if we want to progress, we want to keep in step with the times, as time unfolds, we have to be open always to hearing every point of view, however distasteful. Do you know how distasteful it was for W.E.B. Du Bois, who studied at Harvard, got his PhD from Harvard, studied at the University of Berlin, one of, one of the leading intellectuals at the time, he has to deal with white people telling him, but you're intellectually inferior, you're mentally inferior, look at the IQ tests, look at these tests. He had to deal with that every day of his life. And believe me, you could see, he says it out loud, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But he didn't run, he didn't hide, he didn't cower, he didn't take out the trunch in the club to try to silence his critics. He sat down, looked at the evidence and waited to see where truth transported him. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, comrade. Mm -hmm. I knew it was worthwhile inviting you, comrade. I think you I'm much more with, with you on that issue than I am with Tony Greenstein. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Definitely worthwhile looking at uh, um, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, that's definitely something we could we could look into. Uh, and I agree with much what you said, rethinking our certainties. Sometimes if, for example, fascist, racist ideas become popular in the working class, of course we should debate them and should lay out why they are so destructive and what's wrong with it, uh, rather than say this is not an issue that should be debated. Uh, we need to show what's, what's wrong with it. Quite right, I think you made an excellent contribution for that. I'm so, so sorry, comrades, for running quite so late. I think it's been a really excellent first half, well, first 
two-thirds of the conference, we're going to have to tighten up the second part a little bit. We're suggesting by um, cutting down the time on moving motions. Uh, most of them are quite uncontroversial. Um, comrades, we have a 10-minute break, I suggest. Seeing you again at 5, okay, 25, 5.25. Okay, comrades, uh, I think we're now uh, ready to begin. Uh, I'm chairing the uh, second or uh, the second half, probably the last third of the uh, the conference. And just remind you of the format from the um, from the schedule. We'll have a, a semi uh, Ramadan. We will do a, a, a brief introduction to the session, and then we'll move into motions. We've had seven motions that have been submitted in advance. And uh, I, I'd like uh, the movers of the motions, please, if they could, to keep their move, uh, moving speeches to three minutes. Um, and then we'll throw it open to general debate. And then um, I'll allow um, your comrades to come back in to do a closing uh, uh, set of speeches and replies. And uh, we will then take the votes uh, in sequence. So there'll be a general discussion after all of them have been moved. Um, and then we'll take, um, we'll take contributions and then the vote. The, um, the last section is, uh, will be elections to the steering group. And comrades there can nominate themselves or indeed be nominated by somebody else. We've got up to uh, nine places proposed. And um, we'll be taking the vote by a Zoom poll, no single transferable vote on this occasion. Uh, everybody has up to nine votes. Um, if, um, you know, if, that, uh, if they want to use them. And then the comrades with the nine highest votes, the comrades, nine comrades with the highest votes will be returned or re-elected. Okay then, so um, that's the uh, that's the running order. I hope it's uh, reasonably clear. Oh, I see Norman Finkelstein's already received uh, a nomination. Okay. Um, so, comrades, I'd like to uh, call now uh, Sami Ramadami to uh, introduce the session. Is uh, Sami there? Hi, Sami. Hi, hi. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. And thanks for the invitation to address the conference. It's been really good. I, uh, I learned quite a lot from, uh, from the speakers and the contributions. And I think it was a good debate as well, uh, um, although time was always pressing. Um, and if you don't mind, I might uh, get the chance to comment on the debate about uh, uh, free speech, whether we should uh, um, uh, ban uh, speakers of certain opinions or not. Uh, something that uh, 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 Norma Finkenstein uh, was, was talking about. Um, but I would like to start by stressing the international implications uh, of the uh, uh, anti-Semitism uh, campaign that uh, was kick-started inside the Labour Party, which eventually led to the removal of uh, Jeremy Corbyn as, uh, as party leader following the elections. Um, the international implications are quite important uh, because what the silencing of the critics of Israel um, is going to lead to, if successful, would be to silence uh, any sympathies for the Palestinian people. Because critics of Israel usually refer to the oppression of the Palestinians. And silencing critics of Israel is the, one of the broader aims of the uh, campaign uh, to, uh, to silence the left, socialists, uh, critics of Israel in general. Uh, and the targeting of anti-Zionist and non-Zionist Jews is a very significant feature of the campaign, whereby Israel understands and the leading Zionist organizations understand 
quite well and I've learned from history that critics of an imperialist policy or of a policy of expansion, critics that belong to that country that, that uh, 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 practices such, uh, such uh, uh, racist or expansionist or warlike policies, internal critics are extremely important for any just cause. And Jews who are prepared to declare their anti-Zionism or strong criticism of Israel are seen to be very dangerous by the Zionists, by Israel. So that's on the one hand. On the other, there is even broader reason why this campaign to silence the critics of Israel has been latched upon by uh, ruling classes, especially in the imperialist countries like Britain, like the United States. They latched onto it because they can see that criticisms of Israel is championed by the left, by socialists, by people who call for social justice for the Palestinians. Therefore, to stress and to silence uh, critics of Israel has a, a twofold uh, character. One is to silence criticism of Israel in general, Israel being a close ally of imperialist countries. But secondly, it helps to silence the left and socialists and prevents international solidarity. Because once you accuse somebody of being anti-Semitic, you're, anti you're saying they are racist. Therefore, they will be uh, silenced automatically because there is a policy of not allowing races to express their views. Uh, so this is quite significant and it has to be uh, borne in mind uh, that this campaign for free speech is very critical um, in terms of its uh, implication, extremely important. And coupled with that uh, uh, attempt to silence, uh, if you like, the voices of justice, is to call uh, people who criticize Israel or criticize Zionism as being extremists. And the label extremists is usually being brought forward to attach it to critics of Israel. Because before this campaign about anti-Semitism kicked off in the Labour Party, the label extremist was used um, to silence critics. And to combine it with the anti-Semitism label, it has become quite a dangerous uh, affair altogether to silence people. Um, and while I'm talking about this, I would like to refer everybody, and probably most people here have read it, to a letter which I will post in the chat window, a letter uh, written by, uh, by uh, people, uh, by Jews uh, of Israeli origin and others, but mostly Jews of Israeli origin, who are academics, practicing academics in, in Britain. And they address their letter to British universities to oppose the adoption of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And I am posting it right now. Um, so please use it as a reference because it has a lot of links as well. The letter itself online has a lot of links to various documents and it's an extremely useful uh, reference uh, letter. To, uh, to British universities to reject the adoption of the IRHA, uh, IHRA uh, definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and in case I run out of time, I would like to uh, put my point of view about the debate about uh, silencing critics and whether the principle of free speech should be an absolute or uh, restrictive uh, type of definition. Listening to Norman Finkelstein, I would say that I fully agree with Norman here. I think he is right. I think we should not fear opposite opinions, including those of races, 
including those even of fascists. And I say, I don't say that lightly. And we should not confuse periods of civil war where people want to defend themselves against neo-Nazis or fascists and go on and, and, uh, and uh, stand behind the barricades. Uh, this is a different type of debate. We are not talking here about people being prepared to go and defend themselves defend minorities by force if necessary. It becomes a war of self-defense. This is a different debate from the question of engaging in debate and opposing other views. I think there is no principle which is absolute or is absolutely right, 100%. Even if you leave 99.99%, there is still a bit of doubt. And that bit of doubt allows for uh, room for debate, for challenging opinions. The weapon of censorship, the weapon of silencing people and critics has been traditionally the weapon of the ruling classes, the weapon of the oppressors, the weapon of people who killed and wiped out minorities whether those minorities were in the Middle Ages who believed in the scientific method or actual ethnic or uh, other minorities. It, it has been a weapon to silence critics by the right wing, by ruling classes. And the left traditionally must uphold. If they don't uphold the principle of free speech, then they are conceding ground they are conceding ground in principle to opinions that suggest that other opinions should be silenced. No, we should not be frightened. There is a difference between manning barricades in civil war and engaging in debate like a situation today in Britain. If minorities are attacked by fascists physically, then obviously we should all encourage that minority to defend itself and we go in solidarity to defend them against any fascist aggression or use of violence against them. Calls for self-defense is nothing to do with the debate against fascism, the principles that they advocate, the racist ideologies that they might advocate. And Norman is right. Uh, we, sh we should not uh, uh, start debating who should we silence. Who is the real fascist? Who is the uh, half fascist? Who is the fascist who is prepared to hold a gun and kill somebody else? And who is advocating uh, uh, neo-fascism. Uh, is Nigel Farage a fascist who should be silenced? Or is he a right-wing nutter? Or there, there are uh, a lot of issues involved in terms of trying to decide who to uh, not platform, unplatform, or silence. So therefore, I think we should be careful there uh, the left has the courage, should have the courage of its convictions, argue its point of view. Uh, uh, there is no point of view which is absolutely 100% right. There is no such thing. Science hasn't come up with it yet. So we need to engage. We need to be brave in our opinions and truth will come out. Truth uh, comes out through practice. Through truth comes out through being uh, uh, absolutely materialistic and objective and refer to the evidence and so on. And this is the way to defeat right-wing fascism and racism and not by trying to, to, uh, to shut down debate. We will be that much stronger. And I appeal to the elected steering committee when it gets elected uh, to look at that issue more carefully so that we are not immediately accused of uh, shutting down debate. And uh, Sammy, could you uh, wind up now? I am exactly winding up. That was my last sentence in a, uh, in a way, that uh, we should go forward. And this campaign is extremely important, uphold the right to free speech and uh, with, withstand the pressures that are piling up against people who speak out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sammy. Um, and my apologies for curtailing, but we are uh, 
push the time. Okay, uh, comrades, we're now going to uh, move to uh, motions. And the first one is uh, submitted by Tina Werkman and it's um, called Campaigning Priorities. I think we should be able to see those up on the screen, um, if that's possible. Yes, just a second. Where is it? Okay. Yeah, okay, comrades, this is, um, oops, I'm not, I can't, you can't even see me at all. Sorry, 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 almost there, almost there. Um, okay, this is, I won't, I won't take long to um, um, move this, as it's just, uh, we've, we've discussed a little bit what such a campaign should do, what the immediate aims of the, the campaign should do, where we should focus our our, our strategies etc i seeking affiliations of uh, trade unions labor party branches clps seek well-known sponsors and patrons for the campaign i think norman finkelstein has already agreed because we've asked him so if we agree to do this that would be a very good idea to get some uh, comrades of, of standing involved carry on with zoom meetings i think the lockdown will continue for some time uh, also stress it, stressing as we have the international char character of the the, the witch hunt and the efforts to restrict free speech. And that would particularly look at the IRA misdefinition of anti-Semitism. And um, Jamie uh, uh, has agreed to help us out with this. He's too busy to join the steering committee, but he's definitely got uh, expert knowledge on this. Uh, and of course, prepare model motions, public statements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is far from exhaustive, this list. Um, it's, it's, it's an attempt to, you know, give some guidance to the steering committee how to move forward uh, first of all, but you know there's tons of other things we can and should do, so this is just uh, uh, one, one thing to take us forward to, that's it. Okay, thanks uh, Tina. Uh, Tony Greenstein now on the EH EHRC definition. Oop, where is he? Oh, Tony? Oh, I think I'm not sure I can. Oh, hold on. Sorry, comrades, this is all. Okay, I'm so you, Tony, are you here? I'm here. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah off you go, you go, Tony. Yeah, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on it. I'm advocating that we reject the EHRC report in total, not because we disagree with everything in it, that much of it is uh, quite benign, such as the right of someone who is suspended to know who their accusers are, for example. That is not the point. What we should do is reject the idea that the EHRC had any right to conduct an investigation into the Labour Party in the first place. The EHRC is not an anti-racist or an anti-sexist or any other body. It's a state body nominated, its members, its commissioners, are nominated and put there by the Conservatives. And they're now putting people uh, in as commissioners who support the hostile environment policy. So it, they're not even anti-racist. And as I said, Alistair Henderson, who oversaw the commission, uh, the report into the Labour Party, uh, tweeted and uh, on Facebook, uh, rather, he, he gave likes to, uh, sorry, it was on Twitter, he, he, he gave likes to uh, people like Roger Scruton, for example, an out-and-out -out fascist who edited the, the Salisbury Review. Uh, so it's an utter and total absurdity. The HRC is a state body and we reject state interference in political parties. And of course, it's no accident that Keir Starmer has outlawed any discussion of the report because it's so nebulous, it's so thin. It, it defines uh, harassment, which it applies to an individual normally, possibly a group, in terms of political speech. If you disagree with the fact that Labour has an anti-Semitism problem, then that is harassment. That's absurd. You would then define any political speech as harassment. The Equality Act was quite specific as to what harassment was. Uh, in essence, uh, though the report... Uh, those who drew up the report reached their conclusions and then looked around for the evidence. Uh, and they, in the end, uh, targeted two people, Pam Bromley, uh, 
and Ken Livingstone. And Ken Livingstone's offence was actually speaking about something that was historically correct. So I don't think this will be controversial, but we should reject the report in toto and reject the right of the HRC to investigate the Labour Party in any case. Thank you. OK, thanks, Tony. Um, OK, the next comrade who's uh, moved a motion is Steve Freeman on WikiLeaks. I think it's actually a uh, deeper was moving this. Oh, okay. A driver. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Steve who moved the motion. I apologize for the background noise. I've got a five-year-old and a six-year-old uh, running about. Um, firstly, the case of Julian Assange is not just about Julian Assange. It's about the right of us as activists to campaign about the crimes that imperialist governments commit in our name. It's also about holding power to account. The case of Julian Assange is also one where, like in the case of Jeremy Corbyn, like in the case of many others, uh, positive ideals have been weaponized towards negative ends without a, without a necessary commitment to those positive ideals. And the amount of propaganda has prevented debate of the issue, which is essentially nation states ganging up to suppress free speech. I would therefore urge this conference to support Julian Assange in and make sure that he is freed, not just not extradited, but actually freed. This is a man who is currently in solitary confinement, in effect, because Belmarsh is locked down. Um, over the years, he has suffered a huge amount of physical and emotional anguish, which the UN Special Rapporteur, Professor Niels Meltzer, and the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention have clearly categorized as torture and arbitrary detention. Um, in addition, we are in a situation um, where uh, he has lost some of his uh, peripheral vision. The judge talked about his mental health issues, but this is not a case of mental health, which is uh, related to his personal disposition. It is about five states stamping on his head and causing him to uh, undergo the kind of um, degradation and pain that he suffers now including injuries uh, which have not been treated, including um, you know, him cracking a, a rib because he bent over to tie a shoelace because of osteoporosis as a result of being confined in the embassy. And the state continues to, to prevent legal observer at the trial. I can tell you that, I mean, I, I won't go into the detail of the legal observation because my report will come through formally, but all I can tell you is I was denied access to the trial. We were, it was made very difficult for the public to attend his trial. And most people on the left still don't understand what the trial is about, which means we start talking about a, a range of other things and start talking mm -hmm. about Julian's personality rather than about the issues at stake. So I'd urge you to support this motion and I'm grateful to all the comrades who've sent messages of support in the chat and to Steve for bringing through this motion. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Deepa. Um, the, uh, the next motion is uh, called Labour Party Rights and it's being moved by Tina Werkman. Uh, me again, sorry, comrades. It's actually um, Tony and I have drawn this up together. It's, um, we just thought it would be useful to um, not just discuss what, you know, what free speech means, but also in the context, of course, of the attacks on Labour Party members in particular um, and their rights, because many of us, well, we were in the Labour Party or still hanging on, etc. This is also, I think it, it could be a useful, a useful PR tool. So if you if you build a democratic, a truly democratic organization, what are the kind of rights uh, members should have? Um, and, it, you know, you read really through and it all seems quite, um, you know, obvious and uh, nonsensical to even mention it, but all these things that we're mentioning there have of course been been under under attack. Um, we've also put in the anti-Semitism advisory panel because um, the membership of that has just come out in the last few days and that is uh, if it wasn't if it wasn't so funny um, well if it wasn't so sad actually you'd have to laugh about it because um, it's um, full of one particular viewpoint um, a pro-Zionist viewpoint um, in the Labour Party. 
uh, and there's something obviously it's not even in the Labour Party there are people on it that are not in the Labour Party but quite hostile to it and they are now judging you know anti-semitism uh, allegations in the Labour Party is just it is it's an absolute joke actually so this is um uh, as I say an attempt to positively formulate what kind of rights um, members should have in a Labour Party and it's actually you know it goes beyond of course any democratic organization um, should have that's it Okay, thanks, uh, Tina. Um, this is a bit like the, the, the Tony and Tina show because it's uh, oh, now Tony moving a motion on uh, liberty. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want me to speak now? Yes? Yes, but yes please, Tony. Yes, okay. The, the National Council for Civil Liberties, which is now called Liberty, was formed in 1934 as a result of police attacks on the right to peacefully protest. It's, had quite a long and honourable history in defending civil liberties in this country, including the right to freedom of speech. It's quite amazing that despite the fact that in the 2017 conference, Professor Jonathan Rosenhead of Jewish Voice for Labour successfully moved a motion opposing the IHRA with only a handful of people against it, the officers and staff of Liberty have adamantly refused to do anything about it, including the outrageous attack on universities' autonomy this year by Gavin Henderson, the most incompetent and malevolent Tory minister of all, uh, threatening the funding of universities if they did not adopt the IHRA. He's not interested in any other form of racism, you understand, not surprisingly, given the record of his own party. But the IHRA had to be implemented. And it's we all know what the IHRA is about, and it's not about anti-Semitism. You would therefore have expected Liberty to take it on board to oppose what Henderson, Gavin Williamson rather, is doing in foisting or trying to foist the IHRA on universities. Namely, he's trying to get universities to police free speech on Palestine uh, and on Zionism. It, that is so abundantly clear. It needs really no argumentation. But Liberty has been silent. It said nothing. Uh, and the reason for that is clearly the new Labour politics of much of, uh, of many of those who actually lead the organisation. And I'm saying this should be one of our priorities is to get liberty off the fence. If you think of it in America, where they've been making again using the IHRA and trying to make BDS in essence uh, illegal, the Liberties sister organization, the American Civil Liberties Union, has been extremely active, including funding legal challenges under the First Amendment to anyone who tries to penalize someone for supporting BDS. Liberty in this country has shamefully maintained absolute radio silence. So I think, I mean, not only should people join Liberty to change it, but the organizations should speak out about it and put liberty on the spot. Where do you stand? Why have you done nothing? What are you going to do? Do you not think academic freedom is important in a civil society? If not, please explain why. So I'm sure that the, no one will want to oppose this motion uh, and I therefore move it. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, the next uh, motion is um, uh, moved by Mark El, um, Mark El Cardi. Uh, and it's on um, non-Labour news. Uh, Mark El Cardi. I don't think he's in the meeting, so... Okay, well, uh, the motion falls. Yep. Okay, um, the next one is entitled Democracy Quilt, and it's uh, moved by Nicola Grove. Yes, hello, comrades, and thank you. Tina, could you possibly take the screen share off because I've got something yeah. I want to show. Um, okay, so very quickly, I'm a 72-year-old grandmother. I'm a member of South Wilt CLP, which is one of those affected by having passed a motion in support of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, what I'm, we're proposing, I'm working with three women. I have to say, I'm not active on social media. I have tried publicizing this and it's been rubbish. So I'm incredibly grateful to you for giving me a little bit of space to say, is this something you would like to take on? 
So the briefly, the proposal is it's a project called Sea Red So Loud. Um, and it's in the tradition of artwork and storytelling that um, looks at quilting as a form of resistance. So that's very well known in uh, women's uh, history and in that of indigenous people. Um, our idea is for initially a digital quilt um, which would commemorate what is going on in the Labour Party at the moment. And eventually we would turn that into an actual quilt, which could have a life, um, an eternal life, hopefully, in somewhere like the People's Museum. Okay, why is this important? Why should you support this and in what way? Well, I think the idea for an art project actually addresses four issues that I'm experiencing at the moment. The first one is demoralization and depression. And if I feel enraged and despairing, I cannot imagine what those of you who are directly affected by this feel like. This idea came to me because I spent my time just agonizing, waking up in the night, unable to sleep. Uh, and then I thought of doing something creative and active in a way that would be beautiful and funny. I mean, Tina talked about it being a joke. It is a joke, comrades, and I'm going to show you a joke in a minute. Secondly, um, I think that there is a lot of fragmentation. So what we've got is a lot of different organizations, different rallies, different um, events happening. Whereas if we can create a space which will visually bring everything together, then that is incredibly unifying and creative and motivating. The third issue is that I think there is a real concern for me um, as a woman, and I work with people with learning disabilities, so perhaps I'm terribly aware of this, that so far much of the discussion, or all of it really, has been what I would call really head stuff. So it's very cognitive, it's rallies, it's writing, it's speeches. And what we need is visual art symbols that speak to the heart and are going to transcend uh, and uh, make an impact uh, online and in reality. Because make no mistake, if we don't memorialize history, then uh, we are condemned to repeat it. And what we want is powerful, striking images that will commemorate what is the worst attack on democracy in my lifetime. And as I say, I'm 72 and I've been active in the Labour Party most of my life. Um, so what would it look like? OK, so I'm, it'll be digital and it could be anything. So it's words, it's images, it's photographs. What we hope is that all organisations and CLPs that are affected will contribute something. Here's what I've just made. OK, this is Southwold CLP. And what you can see is the Westbury White Horse enraged out of its normal torpor by what is happening to its councillors and its local Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And our white horse is saying, nay. All right, it's not a terribly <laughs> good joke, but I was rather pleased with it. <coughs> so, what am I suggesting? Well, um, it may be that maybe this is just too narrow for you. I don't know. But you could either adopt it and they provide a page on the website for publicity. We urgently need people to be sending us stuff and we need a little organizing committee because I can't do this all on my own. Um, uh, the way forward is to email us and I put the link in in the chat if you want to contribute an image if you can provide a page on the website that would be absolutely fantastic um, if not just publicizing it and helping us set up an organizing committee so that we can get this moving so that we can create powerful creative funny images that are going to capture the imagination and energize us all thank you very much comrades okay thank you Nicola Okay, comrades, uh, we've now got uh, some time for discussion. I can see two hands uh, raised. So um, if comrades would like to um, uh, unmute. Uh, Chris Williamson, first one. It was only a brief, it was only a brief, uh, oh, hang on, I'm ever plugged. Yes, I am plugged in. Uh, <laughs> no, it was only a brief point. I've made the point in, in the chat now, really. It was just in relation to Tony's motion, which I support. It's just a matter of accuracy, really, on the point five, clause five. There were actually six people who were targeted by the EHRC, not uh, just three. And uh, following the legal 
representations <coughs> that I made, they, they dropped the cases from not just myself, but uh, three others leaving just Pam and Ken. It was just a minor point, really, but I made it in the chat, so, but I made it orally now as so well, so Thank that was it. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Anita Bennett. Oh, sorry, no, Terry was first, I think. Okay, uh, okay, uh, sorry, Terry. Terry. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, comrades, thank you very much for this very, very good conference. Um, I put in a motion to my branch the other evening um, in solidarity with Labour Black Socialists um, because of their deep feeling of being sidelined in the whole question in the uh, Labour Party. Um, it fell because it was 5-5, but what I experienced was exactly and precisely how hard it is for BAME members in the Labour Party to have their voice heard. Not even that they're going to be censored, but to be even heard. Um, it fell because the ob objections to the term hierarchy, um, and so people accused it of being anti-Semitic. But I don't think that was the sole reason. I think it was because the Labour Party would like to see black anti-racists as being tamed. If you raise your voice in anger, and rightly so, considering what's happened to our black MPs, and we now know that the Ford inquiry is being totally demolished, they are incredibly angry. And why not? But they're being tamed. And that's what I experienced in putting forward the motion that I was actually tamed, that I wouldn't, didn't behave in the way that they, we, we, we need to behave. Um, so comrades, I, I, I feel that what we haven't really addressed in this conference is our solidarity with black and BAME members in their struggle in the Labour Party against racism, which is very active. Okay, thanks, Terry. Uh, the next uh, comrade, uh, Anita Bennett. Uh, you're muted, Anita. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Go, fire away. Well, I think that the idea for having a quilt is absolutely brilliant. And I just wanted to say, urge people to have a look at the, um, the Bristol campaign for Save the M32 Maples, which Esther and I have been very active in, uh, partly because it's a bit difficult being active in some of the uh, shenanigans that are going on in the party. Very various advantages to that. One is that it gets us involved in action, you know, particularly at this time. So it's great building tree houses. Some of us have chained ourselves to some trees. We've given Marvin a really bad time over his um, favoring developers over trees and we reach young people and we work with young people. And um, I really, really urge you, people who say, oh, I don't do social media, just try it. I've got a daughter with Down syndrome. You know, she, she goes on Facebook, she loves it. And we need to get through to people where they are and get young people. Because one of the reasons for this free speech debate is that they're miseducated and they need to have action and they need to have us engage with them where they're at. They see us, they, they are generation rent. And we are baby boomers, many of us. And we need to, the green issue, the trees is a really, really big thing. I know it may sound a little bit far out to everybody, but it certainly isn't in terms, because it's labor women in, in Ashley Ward right now who are kicking it up. Um, and just want to say that, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Anita. Uh, Steve Freeman, next comrade up. If any further comrades want to join in the discussion, please, um, use the raise hands function. Um, I won't repeat the, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Kevin. I won't repeat the arguments we've already discussed and, and, and have supported. I wanna make one small point about Julian Assange. It's very, very important. Obviously there are many, many examples of attacks on free speech, but I think we've got to make sure we give this <coughs> particular case a high priority. We've seen that some people have been sacked, some people have been expelled, but this man is in prison. He's a political prisoner who's committed no crime because what he's done is he's made public the truth about what's been going on. Now, these points are already made and accepted by everybody. Lickin, but, um, <laughs>
Can we turn off whoever is. Yeah. Carry on. We have okay. We have the case. We have obviously another very important case in Chelsea Manning. But the point is about Julian Assange. He's in our prison in this country. Therefore, we have a special duty to do everything we can in the working class and labour and trade union movement to help uh, put pressure to get this man out of jail. He should be released immediately. I'll stop there because I'm only otherwise repeating myself. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. <laughs> Uh, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Peters Rucker. Uh, Kevin, you, you've overlooked Amina. Who's no, seen. I haven't overlooked her. Right? Charlotte was on. Avenue first. Charlotte. Tina, <laughs> okay. yeah. can you turn whoever it is off? Yes, I think that was uh, Amina. <laughs> okay, can okay. I call in Charlotte now, please? And then I'll call in Amina. Charlotte, we can't hear you. Could you unmute, please, Charlotte? Oh, uh, that's better. Is that okay? No, yeah, it's okay yeah. now, yeah. It's these that are doing it then. Sorry, I couldn't hear somebody previously. You can hear me now? Yes. yes. Right. What I wanted to say was that what we're missing in this country, and we've been missing for a long time, is any form of public debate. What's just happening here now, and it's been happening for the last hour or two, is just magnificent. And what we need is to get this out in a public arena where the people who disagree can turn up and disagree. This doesn't happen anymore. All we have is an insult from one side, an insult from the other side. And I just wanted to throw that into the mix with everything else. That's it. Thank you. OK, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, and then uh, Amina, please, now. Hi. Can, you, can anybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Amina. OK. Um, yeah, the subject here is building the campaign for freedom of speech, correct? Yes. OK. So um, can you please tell me why you lie constantly and delegitimize Israel? Because it's a racist state. Uh, just it's the not a racist uh, state. In fact, um, you, uh, Tony Greenstein, you have been in doesn't even supply vaccines. Uh, uh, Tony, demise. please let the... No, please so let so, the so uh, Israel is not a racist state. It's not even an apartheid state. So why do you keep delegitimizing Israel? That's my question well, to you. No, Bet Salem are an NGO that's funded by Iran. Carry on. I'm asking the question. Uh, carry on with your contribution. Why? Please. Why does Chris Williamson, who sits there all glorified, yeah, why does he delegitimize Israel? Because of itself, you don't need to. Just... There is no apartheid in Israel. You know that, and I know that. I don't uh, know. That you just say... Trump knows it, and it's in uh, the, uh, all the, we all the anti Israel organizations are a pyramid just, selling uh, scheme. Uh, you know that, and I know that. You're, 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 you're having a good living off of Israel, aren't you, Tony Greenstein? <laughs> Making okay. a good living off the hatred of Israel. Is that right? You really have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. You shouldn't even be on. Okay, I think that's enough. Okay, uh, next comrade, please, who wants to speak. If there's nobody else, maybe we should go to the vote or if there's a need for a right of reply. Okay. Okay, I uh, would... Uh, oh, we have two, two people speaking, wanting to speak now, uh, Jackie Walker and John Bridge. Okay, uh, call in Jackie, please. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I haven't been able to um, take full part. I haven't actually been feeling very well today, but I want to say how important I think this debate is. It's absolutely crucial. It's even crucial that we people like Amina spout and you know I do think we should have let her spout even more of the gibberish that she was spouting because um, I think it's important in a way to refer to what Norman Finkelstein say that we need to know what is is being said in these things I love I love the idea of the quilt and I actually think this this project this 
this theme is becoming increasingly the core issue uh, that we have to go ahead with. It's not about whether people agree or not. It's finding forums that allow people to disagree and to debate. Because one of the huge bits of damage that has been done to the left, and in some ways by the left, is this um, censoring of people, this no platforming. And just to end, just to say this, um, to me it's a sign, it's actually a sign of the damage that has been done to the left, that we now see people who claim to be on the left, actually no platforming other socialists. This is not something that we should be doing. So I just want to make it absolutely plain that although I haven't been able to take as full a part as I have wanted to today, I strongly, strongly am behind this as an issue and as a campaign. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Uh, John Bridge. Yeah, my camera is muted or whatever. Oh, here we are. Thanks. Start my video. Thanks. Here I am. <laughs> um, yeah, I was almost going to say exactly the same as Jackie, and maybe I'm taking up time. But uh, yeah, I mean, to me, the last but one speaker really shows you, one, what we're up against, but also how easily you know, we can defeat such nonsense. So I think we do need confidence. I think we do need to stand for freedom of speech. I know we've got a steering committee that will sort this out, but I do think it needs sorting out, you know, are we a freedom of speech campaign or are we a freedom of speech campaign, but. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, are there any further comrades who want to come in at all? Okay. Um, oh, Anand would like to speak. I think he's not men, um, managed Okay, to... I can't see him on the, the panel, but if you can... Anand, me okay, I'm trying to find you. Um, yeah. mute. Okay. Anand, you, I've asked you to unmute. You need to unmute yourself if you want to speak. There should be a message on your screen. Uh, I don't think the comment. Okay, Stan Keeble is trying to speak. Stan. Yeah, just struggling with the button again. Oh, there you go. Um, no, I just wanted to say uh, I, I think we go ahead with the, all of the motions need a positive vote. Uh, there's no pro there's no real problem with any of them. You could perfect something, but it's fine. So vote for the motions. Let's not uh, worry about that. We do need a good discussion to be organised on the question that uh, that we that we voted through contradictory positions. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Stan. Uh, Victor Logan has his hand up. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Victor. Excellent. In, in that case, I'll jump in and save time. Freedom of speech is precious. To me, it's sacrosanct. Dictatorships like the Nazi one, like Stalin, war criminals like Tony Blair spring up when freedom of speech is crushed. You start off by saying you're giving no freedom of speech to fascists. So you ban Oswald Mosley. Then you ban the National Front. Then you ban the BMP. Then you physically attack Mr. Farage when he's standing for Parliament in Kent. And it ends up with people like us being fitted up as anti-Semites. As such, we're then no platformed. We don't even get a fair trial to put our case. We certainly don't get allowed to put our case because we're no platformed and you don't allow anti-Semites to speak. And eventually it ends into an awful kangaroo court, an awful one-party system with only one view allowed 
because you find that once everyone else's opinions are banned, they eventually come for you. We've got to avoid that slippery slope. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Victor. Um, I don't see any further hands raised. Anand is now unmuted, so he can speak. But he doesn't okay. have the camera on, but he can just speak. Okay, fine. Uh, so, comrade, if you want to come in now, Anand. Yeah. I have a question for everyone. Um, what are your thoughts on the Palestinian Authority? Sometimes it's referred to as PA. What are your thoughts on the Palestinian Authority's NSF or National Security Force? Okay, that's a, a comment. If anybody wants to come in, uh, the floor is still open. We've still got- well, I, uh, could, yeah. I could answer it very briefly if you want. Okay, Tony, if you want to come in and stick to the three minutes. Well, yes, I mean, the Palestinian Authority, which was a creation of the Oslo Accords, uh, was given a task by Israel, which is to police the Palestinians. And uh, they do do that. Uh, they work very closely with the Israeli security forces. So in my view, the Palestinian Authority is a quizzling authority. It's there to act on behalf of imperialism and Israel in particular, and we should have nothing to do with it, and we should give it no support. On their declaration that uh, Palestine is now an independent state is a total absurdity, but it's interesting that in the Jewish Chronicle, when, de when justifying the refusal to give vaccines to the Palestinians, uh, the particular writer, Seth Brantzman from the Jerusalem Post said, well, Palestine is recognised by 139 states in the world, forgetting to mention that, of course, Israel was not amongst them. So it's quite a dangerous idea to pretend that Palestine is already independent. It's not. The PA is not a government. But Israel pretends that it is a Palestinian government when it suits it, when it's using it to deny Palestinians the most basic rights under an occupation, according to the Geneva Convention, part four. So I, I think we should have no truck with it whatsoever. It's a completely reactionary body, which is there to do the dirty work of Israel. In essence, it's there to collect the garbage uh, and to clean the streets, whilst Israel maintains the security in the occupation. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Tony. Uh, there are no more... Uh hands up. So I'm now going to um, just move to um, if co any comrades want to do a, a very brief summing up, otherwise I'll call the vote. Would any any of the movers like to sum up at all? No. No, no, it's okay. just formally everyone. Yes. Okay. Right, comrades, I'm going to uh, move to the vote. Uh, there'll be the um, I think, Tina, we're using the... Um, uh, the poll the that's on your screen, poll. yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, the first motion then, campaigning priorities, motion 2-1. Can I see oh, all those no, in... No, favor? no, Kevin, Kevin, there's a Zoom poll on the screen because the hand doesn't work for everybody. Okay. I've launched a, a, a poll that everybody should be able to see on all the motions. It hasn't... It makes it easier. I think everybody can see it, but you, people are voting. <laughs> I, I can't I can't see the poll. It's because you possibly because you're a co-host, you can't vote anyway. Okay. Me, Tony, and Kevin, we're all you know can't vote. If anything gets a close vote, we can vote. Okay. So uh, <laughs> Tina, can you just tell me uh, are all the motions up on the panel? Oh, I see. On the in the poll, yeah. They're oh, I all see. In in order. Um, I see them now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, comrades, can I see, please, uh, your votes? I'll just give you uh, a few moments to do that. Uh, comrades, uh, sorry, uh, Ashley, were, did you have a, a point on the conduct of the vote? What's this? Um, so, uh, Ashley Reed, I think, put his hand up. Uh, just seen it on the participants. Oh, I, I, comrades are saying they can't submit. Um, I can see how you're voting, though. Every, no, I can't, can't see how you're voting, but I can see, comrades, the vote is working. So there might be an issue with the not submitting one. But 62% um, are voting. Uh, okay, somebody says, can't, um, scroll down. 
We're now voting on the motions that have just been moved by comrades. Um, if you are unsure which motion we're voting on, check it in your um, uh, running order. I'll put, put it again into the... So some comrades are saying, scroll down of the poll and then you should be able to submit it. But I think even if you're not submitting it, we can still see it. Okay, somebody says the submit button doesn't come up if you miss one question. So please do, uh, do vote um, abstain or yes or no on all those motions. Okay, I think everybody's uh, voted, 112 people have voted, 113. So I'm suggesting I'm gonna stop the poll now. Yeah, okay, um, I can... I'm sharing I'm the results here. Uh, okay, the votes in favor were 97% in favor of the, the campaigning priorities with none against, 3% abstained. Um, uh, opposition to the EHRC, that was 95% in uh, favor, 1% against, and 4% uh, abstentions. Uh, on the WikiLeaks issue, that was 98% in favor, 1% against, and 1% abstentions. On Labour Party rights, that was 97%, um, no opposition with three abstentions. On Liberty, that was 95% in favor, 1% against, and 4% abstentions. And on the democracy quilt, 93% in favor, no uh, opposition, and 7% seven, and seven percent, um, uh, abstentions. So uh, thanks very much, comrades, for those um, that unanimity, I think, pretty close to that in, in many areas. A lot there for the new steering committee to um, to get into, I think, there. Um, OK, so we now move on to the elections to the steering committee. And we've had a number of uh, nominations um, which have come in on the chat. Uh, Tina, is it possible for you to share those, uh, those list of nominations? I have been sharing it in the... Uh, in the chat, in the chat. A few times. but um, perhaps we could quickly go through them all. Um, I've tried to email Norman and see if he's accepting the nomination, but we should ask all those who've been nominated if they accept the nomination. Okay, the car, it's now up in the oh, chat. Oh, I've missed, I've missed Jackie Walker off, but we have to, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. She was on my list. Okay, just while we're doing that, um, John Bridge um, has got a hand up. Is this on the conduct of the, the nominations, John? Yeah, I must reluctantly um, decline um, the nomination. Um, Thanks for nominating me, whoever it was, comrade. Okay, thanks, John. So that means... Um, as Sam, far as Sammy's got his hand up as well. Okay. Oop. Sorry, comrade, I've muted you again, sorry. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, just to say that thanks a lot for nominating me. I, unfortunately, time is of the essence. I'm a member of so many different committees and so on. And I feel that I'll let you down if I do become a member of the steering committee. But thank you for the confidence. And rest assured that I will support your campaign wholeheartedly without any reservations. And I think there are some brilliant, well, everybody standing seems to have contributed brilliantly. And I wish you luck. And I will continue supporting the campaign completely as and whenever time allows, I'll come and join you. Thanks a lot.
Uh, hi, comrades. Thank you uh, again. I feel exactly the same as Sammy. I feel immensely touched that anybody would have nominated me. Um, but um, I, it's not something that I have the time to be able to do well, which is what I would want to be able to do. But if you're adopting the idea of the art project and the digital quilt, I will, of course, be coordinating that and work with the steering committee on that. Thank you very much. Cool, great. Thank you, Nicola. Um, okay, we've still got 12 uh, nominations, which is a bit too too many. Um, we're just going to go through quickly all the nominations, if that's okay, and see um, who's even willing to stand or who doesn't want to stand. Okay, there, I put them in there. Okay, Kevin uh, is had com problems with his uh, computer and has just been checked out of the meeting, which is why I've taken over now, but he's uh, confirmed he's interested in serving on the co uh, committee. Tony Greenstein, I believe, is uh, interested in serving on the committee. Can you just say yes quickly? Yeah, yeah. Um, then as myself, yes, I'm happy as well. Chris Williamson, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to scroll through and unmute comrades. Um, Chris, can you hear us? Yes, I can, yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that nomination, thank you. Excellent, okay. Jackie Walker's been nominated. I know you're poorly. Can you hear us, Jackie? Are you still in the meeting? Yeah, I'm here. Are you happy to accept the nomination? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, with such conviction. Thank you, comrade. <laughs> okay. Um, I've now lost my chat window. Just a second. I can't see my own list. Um, Norman Finkelstein is not in the meeting anymore. Um, he did suggest previously when I asked him about this, actually, that he would be better perhaps as a patron. Um, so I suggest we accept this yeah. Um, yeah. suggestion of his and he becomes a patron. Yeah, that's a very good idea. I've also just emailed him, but he's not, not replied yet. But um, <clears throat> maybe perhaps I would suggest if he does uh, reply positively to the email, we can uh, co-opt him um, onto the steering committee, but uh, I'm not sure, I, I think he, he said no at the time. Um, Esther. Um, Esther Giles? Uh, yes, I'd be honoured if people would like that, yeah. Excellent. Um, Anita seems to have left the meeting, Anita Bennett. Hmm, I'm not sure we can. Does anybody, if anybody knows her and got her number or something to ask her, that would be good. Um, Deepa is also, she was on the road and Deepa Driver was on the road and was uh, busy, but she has confirmed to me that she's interested in standing. Um, um, I'm going to take Stan and, oh, sorry, no, John, John Courtney has nominated himself. I'll get back to you, comrade. Um, so I'll take that as a yes. Stan Keeble has been nominated. Are you interested in standing for the steering committee, Stan? No, thanks for nominating me, but no, I'm uh, already too busy by half. Okay, dog. Okay, Terry Deans has been nominated. Terry, are you there? Can you hear us? If so, can you just say yes or no? Oh, Anita said yes in the chat. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Terry Deans. Okay, I'm, I've asked him to unmute himself. I presume he's not on the, or not in the meeting at the moment. Um, okay, uh, what do we do about that? <laughs> Well, can I make a proposal? We have 11 people instead of nine. I suggest we adopt to the more. It's 10, actually, yes. Ten. But okay, yes. it's even more. I don't think we really want to get into a vote. As no, yeah, quite right. Food. Okay. So these are, the, these are the, the 10 people who have been nominated. John is on there. If Ter I mean, Terry, I can't get hold of Terry. If he's not... Um, Keen, then you know we can. We have nine people as we initially agreed, so um, yeah, not, not a problem at all. Okay, John, I think is perhaps the only person we haven't heard from. John. So perhaps John, um, we initially suggested that all all uh, committee members or the candidates make a short speech 
but I think we've all been in the meeting today and you've heard plenty of us and we're running all, almost a bit late. So I think John is the only person we haven't heard from Courtney. So I would ask you to um, speak briefly, two minutes if you could. Hello, John. Oh, sorry, you're still muted somehow. Um, I've unmuted you, but we can't hear you. I um, My bottom screen menu says that I'm not muted. You're, we can hear you now. Thank you. OK, let me sweep across so I can see myself speaking. So, uh, first of all, my thanks uh, to Victor Logan for uh, nominating me and um, to the uh, group members for listening to me briefly. I um, was the Labour candidate for the Bromley Chislehurst constituency in 2015 and then was um, uh, fiddled away from that in 2017. Uh, I was the chair of the Bromley Cooperative Party and uh, have been externalised to Littlehampton. That happened in May 2019. I can explain why. I'm an executive <laughs> member of Labour Action for Peace and was expelled along with two dozen other members on uh, 10th of February 2020, having been told a year before that I would receive a hearing. Uh, as you know, the rules were changed. I have... Um, contacted the cooperative party and to cut a long story short I've been expelled from the cooperative party for uh, a year so I bring that experience to the, to the table uh, as I say I'm an executive member of Labour Action for Peace and one of the things that I might uh, suggest is that we uh, look at a calendar of events for the 12 months certainly thinking about uh, recognising the expulsion of, of those 24 and others that were expelled uh, beforehand, uh, and perhaps have a joint meeting with Labour Action for Peace. We've instituted in November uh, a Labour Action for Peace uh, lecture in the House of Commons in the committee rooms, which um, uh, various members have supported, M MP members and uh, members of Labour Action for Peace because this is a time when we should be defending democracy, uh, including free speech, but defending democracy and making sure that all voices are heard uh, and considered um, in our debates. That's what democracy requires of us. As I say, I'm a Quaker, a grandfather, and I now am retired. I'll be 70 at the end of this month. I live in Littlehampton. Thank you for listening. Thank you, comrade. Um, okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of the candidates? And please click raise hand. Okay, Marie has a question. Fire away. Uh, yes, I would like to ask um, uh, John Courtney, um, what uh, does the Labour, Labour Party for Peace is that the right name? Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, in what way is it relating to um, uh, Stop the War and um, uh, CND and, and all that sort of thing? Could you comment on this, please? Happily, yes. Labour Action for Peace was established about 50 years ago. Uh, some comrades will remember the names of uh, Ron and Rosalie Hazard. Uh, as uh, long-time members. Colin Bastin is the current chair. Uh, our friend and comrade Walter Wolfgang uh, was very active in uh, Labour CND and CND and at Labour Party conferences uh, we always, as Labour Action for Peace, have a joint meeting, uh, a fringe meeting with uh, CND. So that's the closeness of our relationship. I would say that Labour Action for Peace um, has a broader remit than, than uh, CND. 
uh, since we speak about uh, complete disarmament and a world of peace and socialism. And Labour Action for Peace was the first organisation to adopt a plan for cooperative socialism, which uh, I laid on the table um, about eight or nine, possibly not quite 10 years ago. Um, and uh, Frank Jackson, as a fellow um, member of all of those organisations um, and the rest of the executive were all instantly happy to, um, to adopt that plan for cooperative socialism. I hope that's a helpful response. If I haven't uh, made that clear, um, please um, ask again. Marie, ask another question. Go on quickly. Marie, you have to um, unmute yourself. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't mean to be personal, but I, I rather object to the perspective that you have outlined, because disarming everybody means that um, as long as um, those who are, it's making an uh, equi equi equidistance, an equivalence between those who attack and those who defend themselves. And I don't think this is right. I think that we should be on the side of those who fight for progress and for socialism and not just disarm everybody. I don't think this is correct. I don't think this is really the place to debate those issues. No, I think we, um... It's, it's an opinion that we might uh, uh, debate elsewhere, but, you know, it's the, I think on a steering committee for a uh, campaign for free speech, that's entirely uh, appropriate to have different viewpoints on those issues. So uh, Tony suggested we, we don't vote because we have 10, 10 candidates for nine positions. So that's, that's you know, we, we just have 10 people on it. I've just heard back from Norman who says, thank you very much for the nomination, but he, he doesn't, he, should, he thinks he should be part of the UK left in order to uh, uh, properly uh, be able to uh, inter, in, intervene, et cetera. So, but he's very happy to support us as a patron and to come to meetings, et cetera, which is, which is fantastic. Okay. Um, well, who would have thought that we finish more or less on time? It's been an ex excellent day, really. I think it's it's been fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating and for staying. I mean, we've okay, we've shed a few people on the way. <laughs> we've had uh, over we've had over three hundred people in the meeting uh, in a in a working conference, which is fantastic and something I think we could be very very proud about. Um, I'm hoping uh, to work, uh, looking forward to working together with the other comrades on the steering committee. I believe I have all your contacts. John, perhaps you're, you're the only person who I've, I don't know personally. If you could send an email to Labour Against the Witch Hunt, info at Labour Against the Witch Hunt, um, I think alternatively I could get it from the um, Zoom registration link. But thank you very much, comrades. It's, it's been, I think, a, a great education. It's also been quite entertaining in parts. Uh, it's, it's a very important campaign that we take forward together. And um, uh, it's, it's been a, an honor to be in the same meeting with you. I'm trying to unmute everybody so you can all chat or something, <laughs> but don't overdo it. <laughs> Um, apologies for having to switch you off during the meeting, but it would have been a mayhem otherwise. So thank you very much, comrades, and we look forward comrades. together. Thank you very well much. Well done. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an excellent afternoon. Well done, everyone. Julian Assange. That's right. Bye. Solidarity. <laughs> Julian Assange. Yeah. Well